Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Philip uh, Gorino, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in our four-part series around exits with our trusted partner, SCS Capital Partners. Uh, for more information about Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs programming and sponsorship opportunities, please uh, visit us at harvardae.org. Selling a business can be a complex and daunting process uh, from finding the right buyer to addressing legal concerns to ensuring that you receive the best possible value for your company. This special series brings together seasoned experts from SCS Capital Partners who will provide actionable insights on industry best practices, avoiding and navigating potential pitfalls, and ultimately achieving a successful exit. In this first webinar, we'll be discussing why businesses fail to sell with experts Keith Heritance and Nadia Matuzzi of SS SDS, who will provide us with valuable guidance on how to navigate the complexities of, of the business sales process and ensure a successful outcome. Just some house, housekeeping, Keith and Nadia will be presenting, but we'll be sure to allow for ample time for questions uh, from the audience. So please feel free to add them into the chat box and we'll do our best to address them either during the presentation, uh, but most certainly after we'll have ample time for that. So with, without further ado, it's my honor to uh, to pass the baton to Keith and Nadia. Keith and Nadia, welcome. So delighted to have you today. Thank, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it is indeed a pleasure to go through this presentation with you. Uh, just a quick background on myself. My background is, is sciences. I cut my teeth in M&A working as a, um, of a senior director for a diversified publicly traded engineering company, engineering and manufacturing. We didn't sell too many companies uh, every day because we loved buying them and you learn a lot about the process through that. And it was always, it was always interesting. How, how do you expand? Do you do it through organic growth or acquisition? And then I became CEO of a company called Next Cycle, which is probably the most successful recycling company you've never heard of before, originally uh, funded by Warburg Pincus. And we aggressively grew through acquisition and it worked well for us because we had solved some of the uh, mysteries of properly recycling uh, certain commodities. And when we did acquisitions, we could do the math and realize that we could make changes that dramatically improved the prospects of that business in that area. We became the largest glass recycler in North America with operations from California to Maine and Toronto. On my, uh, uh, I'm very pleased to have Nadia joining me. I think Nadia was employee number three at SDS Capital, and she has done. She has seen seen it all. And uh, just ask her to give a quick presentation, uh, uh, introduction of herself, and uh, encourage you to, to jump in on any slide to give some anecdotal references that might make the the presentation a bit more than just reading bullet points. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, so I'm Nadia Matuzzi and I've been with STS, well, we're, it's our 20th anniversary, so I've been here 20 years and, uh, and working exclusively on sell side mandates. Um, so just selling businesses. And uh, before that, I had a number of customer facing and operational senior roles with a number of companies, primarily in high tech and marketing. And I look forward to um, speaking with you all today. We can go to the next slide, please. Nadia. Certainly. Yeah. So every business evolves, transitions, and uh, in essence, uh, sells. Whether it's a family business, uh, publicly traded, it's, there's always something moving. And why do you do it? It's a planned exit. Uh, it's it's a move to take some chips off the table. We saw that particularly in the last two years uh, in the United States, where there were many families thinking there was going to be a dramatic change in the uh, tax of uh, uh, coming out of the, the new, new uh, resident in the White House. And uh, in actuality, in the United States, the M&A uh, industry was very busy. Uh, certain professionals, the tax accountants and, and otherwise, were, were even hard to find at that time because the, uh, the activity was so strong and, and numbers were very good as well. Uh, sometimes there is a shareholder that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, wants to move on. So there's a buyout of shareholders can be difficult to do. And of course, some uh, agreements uh, uh, between shareholders make it uh, the best option is just to sell the whole company. 
Uh, bringing in new capital is another reason. Uh, major shifts in the markets. Uh, forced to sell, uh, sell due to death, disease, disability, divorce, disenchantment. And then the phone rings, which is one of my favorites uh, that I always talk about because the phone rings, it's, it's, you, should be, you should be flattered that the phone is ringing. The phone rings much more often now with the number of different funds and private equity groups that are busy in the market looking for companies to buy and buy side brokers whose sole business is to, is to make introductions of that like. But Hopefully you've planned far in advance of that and don't just react to the phone ringing. It probably takes uh, the better part of a year to do it right. And so when the phone rings, you've got a, a year of work to do before you should really sell, in my opinion. And I would say if you, um, if you are active in the company and you're looking to retire and not stay long-term with the buyer, you it, that runway may be longer as you try and transition relationships and succession plan. So the best way to demonstrate how to prepare to sell is, is to talk, I, I guess, uh, candidly uh, about what can get in the way of having a, a process fail. Uh, I also have a, a strong opinion that a failed process is really bad for your business. You, you can delay a process, you can take time getting to market, and timing is really important. But, uh, but a failed process has a, a huge effect on the morale of a business. You've probably taken your eye off the ball if you're the driving force behind a business, and it, it, it can hurt. So uh, by all means, and there's, if there's a theme to this presentation, it's get the right people around you, be prepared, be patient, do it the right way. Uh, uh, never, never like it when for whatever the reasons that we're going to present today that we don't make it across the finish line. Oops, sorry, I skipped That's ahead. Okay. So the, the main topics that we'll be hitting are, uh, you're too important for the business. Uh, don't have uh, third party financials, which is becoming extremely important in the market today. Your corporate structure is messy. Your company operates operate too, too informally. Uh, the revenue risk is too high. There are, uh, don't see this as much as we, we, we did in the past perhaps, but non-transferable employees or that, that member of the team that's been with you for the long time and you're not sure why he's still there, so to speak unrealistic value expectations, buyer fatigue and seller fatigue and disenchantment, they lump those two together. That, that can happen often, uh, normally after the LOI has been presented and, and things uh, take longer than people want to get to close. And then misalignment finally on the deal structure. Uh, so, sorry, so you're, you're, too, you're too important. Um, it, it does happen, and uh, and what it means is that you control everything, and you haven't shared and put together the structure of your team and empowered them to do what you need to do. Sometimes I think 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 about uh, think about someone uh, trying to assimilate you. What what's the best way for them to get to know your people and realize there's the team there because you're selling a strong management team. Uh, we all know that if a company's doing well. There's a great management team be behind it. If a com company's not doing well, there's probably an average or worse management team behind it. So make sure your, your team is empowered and, uh, and ready to take on this new objective. Can get complicated because there may be members of the team you don't want to share the, the idea that you're getting ready to sell. It can be disruptive. And trust me, you never know what people are really thinking when, when they come face to face with that idea that whoever they're reporting to at the top is, has changed. Uh, so be able to take away, a, take a vacation and know that uh, the com your company is, is um, firing on, on all cylinders. Anything you wanted to add to that, Nadia? Yeah, especially important if you're not planning to stay um, or if the buyer doesn't want you. So one of the things we do early on in the process is look at required and preferred outcomes. And required outcomes are things that if this doesn't happen, you will not do the transaction. And beyond valuation, often one of those is I, I must be gone within six months or I want to stay on for another five years. And so depending how you kind of answer that will change the flavor of how a buyer, how critical and how a buyer will respond. 
I think what I would add to that as well is think of selling your business as the most significant uh, uh, new project you've ever worked on. You've you spent, you probably spent uh, maybe it's generations of a family, uh, maybe it's uh, decades of an individual's life, but you've built this significant enterprise up and now you're going to do the most important thing you've ever done for the shareholders and that sell it. So you need to uh, plan for it like you would plan any other significant business uh, uh enterprise. Um, you need a team. You need to make sure your tax people are, are, are aware of things, your accounting people. Uh, you make sure you have the right lawyer to work with you. And whether it looks like Nadia and I uh, strongly recommend that you bring an m and specialist to help you guide you through the process. There's, uh, uh, as you'll see today, there's lots of things that you need to do and you need to be prepared to go. And oftentimes, as I said earlier, from start to start from the time you say go sell the business uh, after knowing us for some time probably nine months start to finish from when we uh, write the teaser to when we actually have a celebration dinner that the business has, has sold but you can easily spend uh, years or months uh, months or years prior to that getting your business ready to go to market You don't have third party reviewed financials. I know Nadia will jump in, jump in on this. Quality of earnings or Q of E uh, for any significant business now or something we try to almost insist get done in advance of, of uh, getting ready to go to, to market. You, you want the sales of the trailing 12 months or more all to be uh, audited and well reviewed. You want to make sure that all reporting ent entities have had the same financial year end if they have multiple entities. Anything you want to add to that, uh, Nadia? Yeah, no, it's just, um, yeah, you can sell a business on internal financials, but in this environment in particular, um, review engagement as a minimum. If you're a bigger company, definitely audited financials are critical. Um, it just adds credibility. It will help your due diligence go better and um, it, it de-risks it for the buyer because they know that the numbers are, are accurate. Um, on the quality of earnings, that's an analysis usually done by the buyer and, um, and they're testing um, your EBITDA and your revenue and ability to, and sustainability. And what they really focus on there is a lot of um, typically especially in privately held businesses, you have a lot of maybe personal expenses that run through the business. You're paying your sal yourself above market salaries or below market salaries that need to be adjusted and added or deducted um, from for, to improve your results and, and they'll test all of those. So we often, especially in this environment, suggest we do our own quality of earnings before going to market and just make sure that when you get a purchase price, you will hold on to that purchase price. Much better chance of that and not something being uncovered by the buyer. From time to time, clients uh, say to me, Keith, why are we doing all this? And I say, well, put yourself in the mindset that you're going public. You're not going public. You're going to sell your business. But everything that you do, especially your financials, are going to be very carefully uh, reviewed by professionals and so if you have that mindset, it, it will really help, help you get there, in my, in my opinion, on the financials, as well as on other business practices, uh, which I think I mentioned in an upcoming slide. One, Ethan, one question. Oh, sorry. Go sorry, ahead. Keith and Nadia, there are two questions that came yeah. in. Uh, one from Lynn. If selling a technology rather than financials, what is different? Yeah, I, I can start on that. Yeah. So there's there's two different things that you're selling. Your financials, as far as, as we look at it, are table stakes. Um, it's kind of the minimum, you know, they're, typically industries have comp comparables and, you know, and there's a financial valuation, typically a multiple of EBITDA. If you're in a SaaS or high recurring revenue company, it can be a multiple of revenue. And that's a financial valuation that every buyer does. They'll do their cash flow statement, whatever. If you have what we call Rembrandts in the attic, which or, or other value drivers, so technology, proprietary processes, um, 
a, a niche market, a, a, a brand, a, you know, a certain uh, a brand that's, uh, you know, uh, there's a whole list of them that, that we go through. So what we try and do is identify what are those value drivers beyond the basic financials that will get your valuation above that financial minimum. So that's kind of how we look at it. So there's always a technology, a, a financial component to a deal, but the, 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 what really drives the price up are these other value drivers like technology. Is that it? Hopefully that uh, I could add, I don't know if that maybe and not maybe repeat the question so we make sure we answered it uh, appropriately. But during the process, we we really engage with buyers. We want to know what problems they're looking to solve, or what ambitions they have. And then we match that with understanding our clients' business very well and referring to things to our clients because as Nadia mentioned, Rembrandt's in the attic. It could be access to a particular client you have, it could be geography you have you have. It can be technology or processes, which uh, the acquirer is very interested in, in, in having in their umbrella of, of businesses. And that can add multiples if we recognize it and uh, negotiate appropriately. But I'm not sure if we got that whole question. So if we answered it appropriately. There's a, there's a second question actually there um, from an, uh, an earlier slide. Uh, Lynn says, thank you. Uh, and the question was, what did you mean, Keith, when you said, uh, rev, quote, revenue risk too high, uh, as in not enough revenue? Yeah, we've got a whole slide on that. So uh, do you want to wait and we can park that yeah, question? Yeah, let's do that. that one? Yeah. Okay. okay. Corporate structure is is messy. One of the first things I ask a prospective client is how how many how many shareholders do you have? Um, I'm a big fan for uh, in uh, having phantom shares for key employees as opposed to actual sh uh, shareholdings. Uh, simple simple is good. So subsidiaries and trusts set up for tax planning. Uh, non corporate investments. Legacy structures is something we run into from time to time. Uh, the clean just in essence the cleaner uh the better and the fewer shareholders the better uh some sometimes we do a bit of cleanup but but not that often nadia what what would be yeah. your opinion on that as well yeah i mean uh, you know it we we try and do as much cleanup as we can it just makes it a little bit more complicated if there's a a, a you know a a messy corporate or a lot of companies and then it just means more prep work in consolidation and it just makes the diligence process a lot of buyers will want to kind of merge them into one company and then go so th there are ways around it but the cleaner your corporate structure is the the easier it, it is and more likely a buyer will will uh, will will move forward yeah i have i have in the past seen some uh tax structures. Uh, that was one of the most complicated uh, spreadsheets I've ever seen. seen in, and uh, we, it got unwound before we took the, the comp uh, company to market. It was, it was extraordinary and uh, it was, would have been a real problem, offshore accounts, et cetera. And I see a question about what is a phantom share. Uh, typically, what that is is um, they're non—they're not actual shareholders, but they, there may be key executive in your company that have phantom, what they call phantom shares. So if and let's say it's um, you know they have twenty percent of the phantom shares are with the employees. Well, in a in a sale, typically what that means is they act as if. They would get twenty percent of the proceeds, so it's it's um it's that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it's a promise to uh, pay the individual a portion of the proceeds, but it's not an actual uh, ownership of the company. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's it's worthwhile to look at, at past things. And Nadia and I worked on a file fairly recently where a long retired executive had been promised for a period of time, uh, a significant share of both EBITDA uh, and, and the potential result uh, of a sale, that documentation had been done incorrectly. Uh, the person had stopped because the person was now in their 80s. 
had stopped receiving uh, the annual dividend, but the way the wording was uh, was left st still had the potential to uh, uh, own 10% of the company on a sale. So it, it is funny. It, it, it can surprise even Nadia and I what, what you will see some, sometimes when you go through the documentation and make sure everything's ready to, to go to market. Companies are too informal. I, what I mentioned earlier, prepare, pretend you're going public. This, uh, so keep written logs and notes. Uh, all of this uh, has the potential to be reviewed and reviewed carefully uh, by, by, by a choir, especially uh, strategics on, on certain types of, of meetings and, and decisions. Uh, on, on other sides, it's private equity who may look more carefully at, at elements of things. But uh, track your key performance indicators. Uh, start creating, if you don't have already, certain processes, especially with personnel, health and safety. Uh, formalize relationships with suppliers and, and customers. Uh, no, no handshakes anymore on, on any elements of your business. It needs to be something that someone can pick up a piece of paper, review it, and see that it's been done professionally and uh, that it's repeatable. Uh, keep an, organ, or an org chart. It's the first thing people ask for is can I see the org chart? And, and, and it's amazing what a uh, strategic will, will notice from that and be able to, to tell that you have all the right people doing all the right things for that, co for that company to be operating the way they think it should. Don't invent your own special process. I've run into this on more than on more than one occasion. Uh, you want the company to be uh, assimilated. Uh, so if a large strategic's coming along, they, they want to be able to say, yes, we can wrap our arms around that. And there's no curiosities that we're going to have to unwind, especially as it relates to staffing, because uh, staff can can really appreciate some some of those things and be unhappy when they're taken away or modified. Yeah. So, so that, that I think is, is really important. Not, no, no special uh, awkward initiatives. Make it very easy to be uh, taken over. And from a private equity perspective or family office, they want to make sure that you have the systems in place that nothing uh, lurks up and scares them uh, during, uh, after they've made the acquisition. Any of your experience uh, fit in on that, Nadia? Yeah, one of the, yeah, really the more professional, the, especially for smaller companies, uh, or, you know, or if you don't have some of these, the more professional you look, the more a large company feels you can fit into their culture. I've done a number of tech deals into some of the big guys. And sometimes I, uh, you know, they say, but how will they fit in our corporate culture? Um, and the more they have, the more formal and organized and professional you look, the less of a question that that fits. And the more they feel these people can assimilate, these people can integrate. We, the integration cost is not going to be that good. They kind of run professionally. So it's, um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm not saying you have to invest millions of dollars to be like an IBM or a, or a Bank of America, but but it, it, the more professional you look, the easier, the, the better it looks to a buyer. Yeah, cue something up in my head, Nadia. Oftentimes, uh, uh, the president or CEO or significant shareholder say, do I tell my staff? And that that has an impact on here if you all of a sudden start changing things. Yeah. My experience has been to keep this very, very uh, confidential, to not share it with staff. Uh, the, there's a time when when this uh, is obvious. This is an obvious time when you should share with staff and prepare them for a change of things. Uh, it's never business as usual after an acquisition, uh, uh, and you never know what people are really thinking. And I've I've seen some people uh, do some very unfortunate things, uh, mostly driven by fear and greed when it comes to these uh, moments and times. Uh, you may even end up in situations where you're paying a stay bonus to a key person. Usually it's a, a CFO or someone in the financial area because they're the one person that will have to be providing a lot of information 
prepping for due diligence and through due due diligence. So, so uh, I always recommend that you you keep it confidential until it's an obvious time to to tell everyone what to do it. And you have to be very careful about the confidentiality as well. We had one situation where we had to do a phase two environmental inside a plant. And uh, so we're doing a small, a small drill core drilling inside a, an actual manufacturing plant and an employee walked up to the uh, environmental group doing the drilling and said to the guy on the end of the drill, well, why are you doing this? And he said, well, we normally do it because they're selling the business. And so you may want to do that well in advance as well to make sure that, that you're not tipping people off or competitors or otherwise. Yeah. And we prep people. Typically, there's a very small deal team that knows once we kick off a project, the CFO, and it will depend on your business. It's, it's not one size fits all. And the general population doesn't generally know until after the deal is done. So if we do have people coming on site in, in you know, we it's important to prepare them with what, what, what you're going to tell people if you get if you get asked the question. Did you want me to handle this one, Keith? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I can tell you the one thing, but, but what I hate seeing is someone doing a forecast for revenue and it has a hockey stick. Uh, make sure it's uh, optimistic, but it's obtainable. Uh, during that year-long process or longer, people will look at, have the opportunity to, to see your performance. And what we don't want is a, a bit of a hiccup. And so oftentimes timing is important as well. I have a company in market right now, they have a very high exposure to one client and a very high exposure to the oil and gas industry, which is a, a tricky uh, uh, one that's often reviewed very carefully and usually reduces the, the multiples on it. We, we put off going to market by over a year so that the company had time to grow uh, other areas of their business to reduce that exposure. But go ahead, Nadia. Yeah, Jumping. so, and, and to, the, yeah, to the first point is what you don't really don't want to do is, and I've had two deals fail because of this in my 20 years, and um, it's uh, shortly before close and they, you know, the four and, and they missed the forecast. I mean, it's close to the end of the year when we close, they know, you know, 11 months are in, they know they're going to miss by a mile. And um, and in one case, the deal didn't need to need didn't need to take because the the, the the it was still a good value company. But the problem was the seller lost any integrity because they lied about where they were going to come in. And um, and so, you know, it's important that you have optimistic support your forecasts with with meat behind them. So take a look at and start tracking your pipeline. What have I got in book business that's going to deliver? What have I got in identified business and how close is it to closing? And then what's the greenfield? What do I have to go after? And that just shows the buyer that you're thinking it's not just a number based on history that you actually understand what this is coming from. Now, in some businesses like consumer based businesses or recurring revenue, it's different because it's, you know, you're not going to track a million consumers. But generally, in most businesses, we suggest start tracking your pipeline and, 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 um, and moving forward. Um, and so the question before about risk, it's really not about the size of your revenue. It's about how is is how sustainable is your growth and, and that revenue number moving forward. And so, you know, what's your client concentration look like if you're if all your eggs are in, you know, your top three clients start looking at diversifying that. Um, you know, and, and where you can negotiate contracts. So contracted revenue has higher, less risk than uncontracted revenue, you know, and, and there's other things that you can do to kind of um, reduce the risk and, 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 and that the buyer will put on the deal when they're doing in diligence. Hopefully that answers that previous question. Uh, I, I've been in instances where I'm quite, quite positive that the buyer is delaying close that because they're expecting a wrinkle in, in the financials that, that because they know the industry well enough and they're trying to uh, get a lower price because they can they've because the company hasn't hit its revenue and profitability during that course of the, yeah. co course of the uh, discussions. Sorry, it keeps flipping on me. Okay. 
Okay, this technology is never, it's always going to give us a trick, Nadia. Yep. <laughs> or user error. Yep. There were, so there was one question from Robert here. Uh, don't stock options accomplish the same thing as phantom, phantom stock? Um, stock options, yeah, yeah, yes, they, they do because they're exercised, uh, it, depending on. I'm trying to agree and but and think about it at the same time. It depends when they're ex exercisable. If they're exercise, uh, you know, if they're so so yes, it could be after the fact, so to speak, or uh, on the sale. Yeah. Yeah, they could. Okay. Keith. Sorry, I was thought there was another question coming. Apologies. Okay. Um, so non-transferable owners and managers. Uh, we've talked about that a, a bit already. Uh, people that are very close to the owner, perhaps they're overpaid, perhaps they're given different uh, incentives or, or benefits uh, and sort of this, uh, a special circumstance, uh, salaries and qualifications not aligned with the industry standards. Uh, seeing less of that in, in my experience, I'm sure Nadia has seen more of that, but uh, does does still happen so yeah, align then, align the, uh, the interests of, of people yeah. anything else you want to add to that Nadia uh, it's more important where if, if it's a buyer that's in your industry and is looking to integrate a lot and has expertise it has it's it's less important if it's a buyer a foreign buyer that's really just looking to enter your market and is relying on it these kinds of things become more important so it's, it, it will be buyer centric. Yeah, th those circumstances, uh, I think the other thing to mention here is this is perhaps a more emotional process than uh, if you haven't been through, through it before than you might think. It's emo certainly emotional for the seller. It can also be more uh, very emotional for key employees. And if you have a, 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 an employee who's been given certain benefits and these things are about to change and they know it because there's a new ownership team, a new management team coming in, uh, they probably will react uh, poorly. Not, not that they're necessarily going to uh, cause the transaction to fail, but they're going to be a distraction and, and a concern that, that may cause the buyer to rethink things. Unrealistic value valuations. Um, what I might say here is, it's not one of the bullet points, is put together a team that you really trust, that you're very comfortable with. Uh, so if you have your, you know, your accountants, your lawyers, and your, your M&A professionals, be be clear with them as to what your required outcome is. Uh, I need, uh, and, and that can be not just financial, but I need X valuation or I'm not going to sell. Tell them that at the very beginning. We give guidance to buyers and we can uh, be much more efficient that way and need be. And, uh, and as we get close to the very end with value expectations, you're, you're always welcome to negotiate hard. And we oftentimes get the potential uh, auction at the end where there are two or three companies who really want to buy your business. So that valuation can move dramatically. Nadia and I worked on a project last year where the, the, the expected outcome was 85 million. And by the time we were done, it was 137 million. So things happened between uh, in the last number of months of a process but be very clear with your advisors. If you're changing your mind, let us know and, and, and so that we can work through it. What we, because we're the ones managing the expectations of both sides. And if valuation starts to jump, start to jump around or become uh, unrealistic, uh, that will kill a deal because the, the buyer just doesn't think there's ability to get it across the, uh, Cross the finish line because the goalposts keep moving in one way or another. The other um, thing, yeah, go ahead, one, yeah, yeah. So I had an example in an HVAC business. We went out to market. We got five offers in, all significantly higher than what the um, the seller was expecting, uh, but he got greedy. 
Um, well, if we can get this this fast, then we should be able to get a lot more. Um, our guidance was these are really good. They're above market. And, and there were a lot of good parts of the deal. Our guidance was not to delay. Um, anyway, he delayed. Um, they were in consumer HVAC. El Nino hit. They had the worst winter on record. Um, their numbers tanked. And um, we did end up selling the company several, uh, almost a year later when their numbers recovered for the same money they could have got the year before. So it, it's just one, you can get wrapped up in it and um, un, you know, understand when it makes sense. Market conditions can change, business conditions can change. Uh, if you're getting above you know, a, a, a better, a, a, what you want and or better, um, it's, it, it's usually behooves you to take it. The thing to re remember there is a, a, a letter of intent is not a transaction. Lots hap lot, a lot happens after the, uh, when we, we, we receive letters of intent. We tell other potential buyers that letters of intent are being received. Uh, the fear of losing out is a huge motivator in this business for, uh, on the side of the buyers. And numbers can change dramatically. You just have to be uh, as open as you can be with the, the people that you trust or around you to, to make sure that we, we uh, don't overplay one hand or start chasing something that, that is unattainable. As I mentioned before, uh, if you tell us this early enough, we may uh, change the timing. Timing is, is everything. Uh, so, and uh, you should be patient throughout the whole process uh, from start to finish. It always takes longer than you think. A day in your world is a week in our world when lawyers and uh, a variety of groups are commenting on a particular clause of, a, of an agreement at any stage of the process. So buyer fatigue is also uh, a risky thing to, uh, to flirt with on the other side, uh, asking too much, uh, being too rigid, uh, lawyers creating too much chaos. Uh, Nadia, Nadia and I make sh uh, manage the, your professionals as best we can. Uh, they're providing uh, key elements to it, but the, their job is to protect you with uh, contracts and not to get too involved in negotiations and, and other elements. Uh, you're paying them a lot of money every time you have them on a phone call, so it's also going to be very expensive if you if you let them. Uh, uh, adjudicate their own hours and contributions. So we work with them very closely and, uh, and manage that uh, participation, if you will. Um, some things can happen on the buyer's side that impact their motivation. We see that uh, quite often. I think we jumped slide. Did we jump slides there or no? no um, well, I'm, oh, we you did we did buy oh they're backwards. You talked to them backwards. It was buyer first and then seller. Oh, I'm sorry. Spoke yeah. to seller. Okay, now you can speak to buyer. Oh, I, I, well, I think I was talking to that one that just jumped around, Nadia. Um, this was seller fatigue. Yeah, and so this probably, they're the same in yeah. some way. Yeah. Yeah. Length of process. I saw that on, on seller fatigue uh, is often the case. Keith, when is this going to end? Uh, we've been. I've been talking to you for over a year now, um, and so prepare yourself. Uh, be patient. Uh, it's certainly what happens on our side that is not talked uh, uh, probably often enough is that we have a whole team of people that do outreach. Uh, we prepare our outreach, not just for your jurisdiction, but we will look at the entire globe. Uh, the world's very small these days, and there can be companies in Europe that really want a foothold in North America, for example, or are interested in your technology. So we will often go to reach out to hundreds of companies looking to find that one that really falls in love with with yours of course we're, we're hoping that it's two or three so that we get a bit of a silent auction at the end this this takes time we use databases we have over i think approaching three thousand advisors around the world that look at our, our our deals with us and and contribute to the process perhaps they know uh through personal connections and in business connections the right person to to be interested in your business so, uh, so it, it does. It just takes time to uh, be able to get into the executive suite of a company to talk to the right person. 
We have our own techniques of how to do that, uh, to get them engaged. And nowadays, if I've seen anything in the last year, the the timing seems to have been stretched. There's so much uh, going on, macroeconomic elements. Uh, logistics was uh, a huge, you know, was a huge problem for most businesses two years ago. Now logistics is in recession. Uh, there's a, an unfortunate war in Europe. The uh, price of oil and gas and other commodities are whipsawing, affecting numbers. So everybody on the, on the buy side is just as busy as everyone on the sell side, and it just consumes time. We're not always top of mind uh, during the process until we get to the very late portions. And, uh, and on that same transaction that Nadia and I worked on that went from 85 to 137, it was the last, it was the last company we talked to that came in at that number now, after a year in market. You get a lot of no's before you get, you get more no's than yeses, and you yes, have to be prepared true. for that. Yep. Oh, it jumped again. Misalignment. Nadia, where you go on this one? This is, uh, this is where, uh, uh, in our world, we have analysts and project managers that are on every call from start to finish in the process. I'm the managing director on a process, so I'll be on almost every call. And then we have a director, Nadia is a director on a firm. Uh, she'll write the teaser, write the book, uh, and uh, do all the financial analysis. And uh, as we get close to a close, the directors get extraordinarily busy on a, on all of these issues. So I'm uh, so go yeah. ahead, Nadia, and, and yeah, speak sure. To so yeah, yeah, so deal structure is there's a number of things. You know, you sign the LOI and you think you've agreed to everything, but there's a number of things that um, you have to agree to. One is what kind of tax structure are you doing? Seller usually wants a share sale. Buyer usually wants an asset sale. In Canada, you can do hybrid sales. It's a bit of a compromise. I don't think you can do them in the US. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, and so you need to consider uh, that's an important point to get out early because it will impact your net proceeds because really purchase price is important, but net proceeds is what you're really taking home. So uh, you need alignment there. Um, and you know what how much is up front how much is going to be in earnout so based usually structured based on gates of performance um, our philosophy tends to be make sure that you're happy with a cash up front and uh, uh, as much as possible and the, the earnout is a bonus um, because you may or may not ever see that money um, holdbacks are usually things like escrow uh, to cover reps and warranties so there's th those kinds of things um, and a number of other things, working capital and um, what you agree to there. So mis you know, misalignment on some of these points can foil a deal. Or again, I always like to say this is, all of these are not why necessarily deals fail, but maybe deals fail to get your required outcomes the way you wanted them. So yeah, um, yeah. and so you know, there are a number of things once the LOI is signed, that still can impact the transaction and you wanna make sure that it's a win-win and it's a good compromise for both sides. Uh, working capital definition is always something that gets debated uh, near the end. It's one of the final things in the transaction, basically uh, current assets minus current liabilities. What you're really doing is negotiating uh, with the uh, buyer that the company as you leave it will be able to manage the next couple of months without a, a strong infusion of cash uh, that can that often is a hot button with clients as uh, because we mainly for example you can do a deal that is uh, debt free cash free which means the day the transaction closes the the bank account is is emptied by this the seller so working cap, what's happening with accounts receivable and accounts payable is, is something that's critical for everyone to consider during that transition. I've also seen a, uh, a client knowingly invest millions of dollars preparing the company for the future, uh, knowing that they were uh, preparing to sell and that the majority of that capital investment would be enjoyed by the buyer and not, not by the seller, but the uh, that was just the way they, they ran their business and they wanted the business to prosper going uh, forward. But certainly they, they left money on the table there. And to some degree it was negotiated as closing as a consideration that that can also happen. 
but but it was very interesting to see their commitment to uh, that business going into the future as in food manufacturing. Uh, uh, very, very interesting ownership group there. I think that brings us to the end. Happy to answer any questions uh, and, and hopefully uh, as Nadia and I sort of sharing experiences and not just reading off, uh, off the form made it a bit more dynamic and spurred some thoughts for you to ask some questions. Wonderful, thank you, Keith. So there are two questions that came in. The first was from Cynthia and she has a question regarding uh, phantom stock. She says, I'm developing, uh, developing a community development banking platform as a nonprofit and will license the platform to, to a for-profit organization. An accelerator is considering, considering investing 300K now However, they expect stocks in the uh, for-profit. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of structuring the deal? Ooh, feel free to jump in. Um, happy yeah, to have a, a chat offline. I don't know if I can give, I can uh, fairly give that an appropriate uh, response, just uh, even though it was a clear description. Um, I would say the same, yeah. maybe we can schedule an offline conversation on that one. Yeah, the phantom stock is well, really a promise, uh, a promise, you know, a letter promising that you will pay the, an individual uh, the equivalence of uh, from the proceeds of a, of a sale. It's as simple as that. It gets law, uh, you know, uh, it should be done properly by by an employment lawyer, but uh, very very common. Great. So, um, okay, and we have a second question here from Jonathan. Do, do prospective buyers easily see or look? for sales staging and financials. Uh, in other words, uh, or for example, a founder begins to prepare a company for sale by reducing taking dividends one to two years prior to putting up for sale, like staging a house. It's obvious what features of the house are historical and what decoration was brought in last week. Yeah. I can try and field this one. Yeah. So we should maybe talk a bit about normalizations as well, which blends yeah. into that whole line of thinking. Yeah. But go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So yeah, so you can you you can pull you know it, it's that's where working capital comes in and and they'll look at you know what do you need to run this business you can pull out all the money you want ahead usually deals are cash free anyway but if the business is if you're taking everything out and you're not putting any and you're not leaving any money in to uh, run the business the business will fail if you're not putting money in to grow the business the business leaving enough money in to grow the business then the business will be less attractive and that will be reflected in what you sell it for so it, it, it will it will come out um, but there are things like normalization to what Keith was saying that you can you can pay salaries uh, to uh, to family and friends that don't work there. You can do all kinds of things to manipulate tax and expensing things that should be capitalized. There are a number of things that you can do, but they do come out. And so, for example, cap, you know, expensing for tax reasons when you should be capitalizing. Yes, it will come out in that you're saving taxes now, but the government will come after you in capital gains because you're not going to have enough of an asset base and you're going to have too much goodwill. So it'll hit you on the on the back end. So, you know, and so most things, you know, they come out either in working capital, they come out in, 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 um, in your final taxes, or they'll come out in your, um, in your purchase price. Is that sort of answer? And, and anything, and anything that you're doing that's not business related will get normalized out, um, whether we do it and present a normalized one or the buyer does it, it will come out as they will do a forensics. And if I'll add to that, Nadia, you know, how, do you, how do you increase cash in the business? You, uh, you stretch your payables, you try and uh, chase your receivables and you reduce inventory. Um, the acquirer will look back if they're, if, uh, and, and see it. So I, I, uh, I, I really uh, try to dissuade clients from from trying to make money through that process. Uh, I think it'll get caught up, and uh, it has, it's one of those buyer fatigue issues. It's one of those things that can say, "Wow, look what they've done over the last three months. Uh, do we trust them? Can we can we rely on everything that they've told us? Is there sleight of hand going on here?" So I always say, business as usual. 
through the through, through the course. Uh, yeah. Work hard to hit your numbers. We'll try and make sure that we don't that we do ever. Uh, we spend a lot of effort trying to make sure we don't interfere with your time and your ability to run your business. We have weekly meetings that are organized and quick and simple throughout the whole process to make sure that we're an hour of your week and, and nothing more other than I'm sure the thought process that you're having uh, about, about the whole circumstance that you find yourself in. But uh, you know, buyers are very sophisticated. The, the numbers will demonstrate uh, very clearly any changes that you've made into, into your process. Perhaps you scrimp on capital expenditures, but in a manufacturing business and businesses that are capital intensive, the question always comes up, what, how much do you spend a year to maintain your business in, in the operating order that you want it to be in and how much are you planning on spending over the, how much have you spent in the last uh, number of years and into the future to, to grow your business with the capital equipment th that you know you'll need to satisfy the demands of your customers? Th these, these questions are always asked. Great. So another question from Farhan, uh, can you expand on the notes about factoring out owner's salary and norm uh, normalizing EBITDA? Yeah, I, I, I sort of alluded to it in, in my last answer. So typically you have your financial statements and you'll calculate your earnings before uh, taxes, interest, and depreciation. And then what you'll do is look at, okay, the owner's salary, the owner's paying himself a salary of a half a million dollars a year. Market as CEO, or market market for that CEO. Uh, that CEO in you know you can hire a CEO and market is two hundred and fifty thousand. Well, you can tack on to that. You can normalize the EBITDA and say it's understated by two hundred and fifty thousand. And and you take that two hundred and fifty thousand and you put a multiple on it. And so you put a ten multiple on it. That two hundred and fifty thousand is worth two point five million to you in purchase price. It's that kind of it's that kind of stuff uh, that um, that we do. Um, you have one time in uh, legal expenses. For some reason, you had a, a legal expense with an employee. Um, you would normalize that back in. Um, there's a whole list of things. Personal. Some people run their car, their personal cars and cottages and whatever that. A, a buyer will not have to pay for, and those things get, uh, they, they get, they would all get normalized back. A personal travel that you run through the business, it's those kinds of things that you always start with the financial EBITDA, and then you layer on the uh, other things that these normalizations. If you had a huge um, uh, enterprise, uh, you know, a, a technology installation, and it, it was a big expense, that kind of stuff could be normalized as one-time, non-recurring one-time, uh, non-recurring one-time trans costs. Yeah, I, I think the other way to put this is um, we we don't judge you. That's not our role here to judge you on what expenses you put through your business and. Uh, it, within reason, the buyer's not doing it either. They're expecting some normalizations. I was on. Uh, I was at a. A function and there was an accountant advising people to stop those expenditures prior to a sale and I didn't think that was necessary. There, there can be some things that are a, a bit eye raising uh, but uh, you know it's not a function of, of we're judging you. We're making a case that this is not uh, this, these expenses will not be incurred for the business to function properly going forward and therefore we can back them out. Great. We have a number of more questions. Um, just so you know, we have the, the program today scheduled to uh, end at a quarter past the hour. Uh, so we'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, but um, uh, so the next one came in from Jonathan and he said, uh, and how are ESOPs handled when the company is sold? So typically, what will happen is in most companies when 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 they're buying is well if it's a share if it's a share sale they're buying the shares of the company anyway so all of the benefit programs every you know typically come now whether it's a share or an asset sale the buyer may want your their employees your employees on their plan is they're planning to integrate that kind of stuff generally what what happens is and most is the employer offers to 
it's written usually in, in the sale purchase agreement that they will take on the employees with a comparable plan to what they currently have. Right. So, um, so the employees may not get uh, their stock, their, their stock option plan may go, but it may be replaced with something else. It's really going to depend on the buyer and, um, and, 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 and the risk to the buyer of losing employees. So they can just come over and offer the same benefit programs, or they may do something completely different, buy out those shares or, or di, you know, uh, divest, get, get, you know, do something with those shares and put them onto their own benefit plan. But buyers generally don't, well, will not just inherit the plan. There'll yeah. be some change. Yeah. Great. Uh, next question again from Farah and uh, any unique considerations for merger with proceeds being part cash, part equity or combined entity where both parties stay on? The, you know, the biggest thing you want to look at there is anti-dilution. Is, is anti so generally, if you're merging and you're and you're a bigger and with a bigger corporation and you, you're taking an equity share, which and and but and they, you know, what you want to make sure is that they don't put in a whole bunch of capital and all of a sudden your shares are worth, are diluted and, and not, and worth a lot less. So that's the one big one. Um, is, but, you know, that, that's the one I would, I would focus on is making sure that your 20% is still worth 20% five years from now. Great. And not diluted. And Robert had a question. Uh, he says uh, earlier, you stated that exit multiples are usually based on EBITDA, but sometimes on revenue. Why isn't it, is it, why isn't it the reverse? Since unlike EBITDA, revenue is cleaner, not manip manipulable. Because it's about profit, um, right? So yeah, and, and EBITDA is only, you know, EBITDA is not that manipulatable. I mean, at some point you have a, a profit line. So what they're looking at is, is mo in most cases, they're looking at, I could have a hundred million dollars in revenue and with zero EBITDA. And, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna get, a, you know, a 10 times revenue multiple or a five times or a one time. And so it's really about profitability of the company is what in most cases, uh, there are strategic cases um, where revenue is important, where they're trying to buy market share and they feel they can, you, you, can, you can sell companies that are distressed. Typically they're not on an EBITDA multiple, uh, but, but for most profitable companies, they, the, the buyer is looking at how much can I, what is the profit I can, the cash flow and the profit I can generate from this, not the revenue. Yeah, the re revenue model is often used for uh, software sales. Uh, SaaS, yeah. you know, it's often referred to as the SaaS model. Uh, I had a, a, I'm a member of Young Presidents Organization. I had a YPO friend walk up to me and I, he was in my forum and he said, I sold, sold my business and I didn't know. I was not in the M&A at the time and I didn't know his business was for sale, but I knew that his business had revenue of about 10 million and break even. And he walked up and I said, I sold the business. I said, fantastic. How did it go it turn out? He said, it was great. I got 10 times revenue. And that was at a heady time in the software industry where he got $100 million for a $10 million a year business that wasn't making any money. We don't see that as often anymore. Yeah. One thing where I will say is if there's an earnout component to a deal, so basically they're offering to pay you some money for the future of sales. Um, you want to be careful there because it, it really depends on how they're going to run the company. Because if, if they're going to throw a whole bunch of expenses onto the company, integrate it where the EBITDA is not, not really clean, then you're likely not going to want your earnout based on EBITDA. You're going to want it based on revenue or based on gross margin or something that is easily controlled and easily seen and not easily manipulated. So that is the one place where I will say you may want to consider revenue versus or gross margin versus EBITDA is in an earnout, if especially if it's not being run as a separate division and um, and and you're losing control. And then thinking on the SaaS model, just to go back to that, is it's a very high growth. You're growing very quickly. 
uh, you're reinvesting in the business. So you're, you're not in the business of generating a profit right now. You're in the business of generating a platform or owning a particular space. And it's a bit of a race. Great. We have uh, one uh, last question from, uh, from Robert, uh, continuing on um, exit multiples and projections. Isn't the multiple based on a, on a forecast of the next three years of revenue of the startup being acquired, i.e. the acquirer projects how much revenue the startup will add to the acquirer in the coming years. And because the acquirer knows its own costs, it alone can then uh, uh, translate how that new revenue will boast, uh, boost the acquirer's EBITDA. Yeah, um, typically it's based on trailing. Uh, so the, the, the cash up front is typically based on trailing 12 months EBITDA. So it, and, and that's because it's, it's, what, it's, what, it's how the business has performed. Earnouts are typically based on future EBITDA or revenues or whatever. And what a buyer's not going to do is let's assume your next three years are, you know, it are higher than your last three years. But if they multiply the EBITDA based on your next three years, they're basically going to be losing, you know, they're not making money because they're not, they're going to incur all the expenses for that revenue. Yet you're going to get paid. So you can't expect to have them incur all the expenses and the risk on that revenue and have them pay you up front for it. So that's where the earnout component comes in. I believe that makes sense. If I, if I heard the question correctly, uh, talking about how different acquirers look at your business, uh, private equity, or if, I, or if you could say a, a leveraged buyer, uh, they're really looking at your ability to safely manage that debt going forward. So the yes, as Nadia says, they're looking very carefully at your trailing numbers and making sure that you can continue to do that for the next three to five years. Their, their multiples are dropping right now as interest rates have jumped because their math is a, is a bit more difficult to work safely. Uh, interesting, a strategic is probably looking at your business going, nice business. We're wondering how we can make even more money you're making with it now based because on the fact that they have uh, they're bigger, they, uh, they bring whatever heft technology, uh, marketing capability, whatever it might be to, to the table. They're going, wow, you're making uh, $10 million a year. We think uh, we're doing the math. We've got some people from our operations working on it. We're wondering how we can get that to 15 in very short order. So at this moment in time, strategic multiples are, are holding as best they can, and the uh, private equities are slipping. Uh, the, those multiples are slipping a bit. Their math uh, doesn't work. Remember that private equity uh, want to sell your business, so they have to buy it right to do to to do that. Whereas strategics generally uh, much more interested in owning your business. Excellent. Does anyone else have any other questions for our guests? Well, I would like to thank you both for a really fantastic, rich conversation, uh, really amazing information. Uh, and uh, if folks want to get in touch with Keith or Nadia, I believe that uh, Canon uh, has uh, included um, email addresses here uh, as well. Uh, and in terms of the, the slides, um, uh, should uh, same thing, should they contact you or will we, uh, I'm not sure if we'll be providing them or should they contact you guys? Uh, Either way, we're happy to share them. Yeah. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Excellent, well, thank you so much once again and thank you everyone for joining us for this very special uh, uh, session. And uh, we hope that uh, this is just the first of four. Uh, so we have another one in uh, two weeks. Uh, please check out the website and uh, 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 we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you, Keith. Uh, I hope, I you, hope the information was helpful. Yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thanks so much.